This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. So get ready to rock. The, the other thing I would say, if you're going to track a record, and this is, you know, what I was talking about with, like, when you're tracking, you are mixing. If you're going to put two mics on a guitar, send them out through a bus and put them to one track. You know, and if you aren't confident enough to do that, then you probably have no business tracking a record. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. The Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. In the studio, this means that critical details from your microphone get through to your DAW. The 101 was used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon. Today, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the STX100 mic pre. Learn more at Spectra 1964. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Craig Alvin, a producer, engineer, and mixer, and Grammy winner of the 2019 Record of the Year Award for mixing Casey Musgrave Golden Hour. He's also been nominated for several other Grammys over the years with a long list of credits, including... Amy Grant, Vanessa Carlton, Lady Antebellum, Frankie Ballard, Chase Rice, Will Hogue, The Features, Butterfly Boucher, Aaron McCarley, Hanson, and How I Became the Bomb. And of course, I put together a YouTube playlist to share some of Craig's work with you um, in the show notes. So just make sure you click through for that. Craig has been making records for over 20 years, spanning multiple genres of music. He's also been a guest on this show previously, way back on episode 29. So we're long overdue to have Craig back on the show. Please check out that episode to hear more of Craig's backstory. Um, today, we're going to really get a chance to focus on his new studio, talk about mixing great records and creating a Grammy winning sound. Please welcome Craig Alvin to Recording Studio Rockstars. Craig, are you ready to rock? Dude? I am ready to rock. Welcome back, man. It's a pleasure. I, I enjoy uh, hanging with you any time of day, but it's nice to just be hanging with you again for the podcast. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks. Um, tell us a little bit more about what's been going on in your world recently, man. I mean, 
of course, like I said on the last episode, you got a chance to kind of talk about how you got in, how you got here in the first yeah. place. But you've been doing a lot. Yeah. Well, uh, some things that have changed. Uh, my studio that I was in for over ten years at, over at Marathon Village, uh, I moved out of there and uh, have opened a new mix room over on the east side near Five Points. And uh, I really like the new spot. Uh, it's far less expensive. And uh, it sits on top of a, my mix room is on top of a tower that's on top of the hill, looking over the river straight at downtown. I have, you know, big French doors and a deck that I look out, you know, and get to see this, you know, the city and the sunshine. That's, and, that's new. Yeah. I think in your yeah. uh, previous studio, you look out and you see the intern or the assistants kind of working furiously away yes. in front of you, right? Yeah, and no windows. And no windows. Yeah. No, no natural light. Yeah, no natural light in my previous studio. So I basically sat in a in a cold, dark cave for 10 years, and now I'm, I'm out. And it's good to be in the sunshine. You know, I... Uh, we're not getting much natural light today, but we do get a little bit in through my control room window, which yeah. is nice because it comes into the live room from up above. Uh, but then I'm I'm also really fortunate to have a door that we can just open. And I yeah. think I put a lot of dust in here, but I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Quality of life takes precedence. Exactly. Um, well, I do care, but, but um, you know, manage it and deal with it. Um, so... What were some things that are different about your new studio um, as far as your setup or anything like that? Is it is it very similar or did you decide? I mean, that's one of those things I think yeah. we all go through a little bit. Every time you set up, you're like, oh, I'm going to improve on the last thing I did. Yeah, um, I did change some things. I still uh, still use Harrison Series 12 console, which is a uh, analog console, but it's digitally controlled. So I have full recall and automation of every parameter on the board. Um, did some modifications to that, uh, recapped it, uh, went through all of my outboard gear, had that all serviced and, you know, recapped and cleaned. Um, I added a few things, including an EMT 140 plate reverb, which nice. I love. Um, uh, also picked up, a, an old mic mix master room with the, uh, external reverb tanks that mount on the wall. Um, oh, cool, man! So that I've got a, a master room right here, right next to me. It's yeah, the, the, the rack mount version. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fun. Gosh, I love that thing. They were expensive back in the day, you know, in nineteen early sixties money to spend over two thousand dollars on a reverb. Wow, no that doubt. Was, that's you a know, ton. I have I found the original sales brochure and. That's a, that was a lot of money back then for a spring reverb. <laughs> well, I remember this one. Um, what I remember reading about it is that they had some new way of staggering the springs, and it, it meant to like it was like boing cancel or something yes. inside. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the one I have is earlier, um, and it does. Uh, it has these sealed reverb tanks that are actually just in PVC pipe, and uh, they they just mount to the wall. And uh, they're painted gold, so they kind of look like, you know, church organ pipes or like something like that. Like just two big pipes on the wall. Yeah, there's a three-footer and a four-footer. So, you, Who, you know. Who's making their own spring reverbs these days? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, the the Somebody tanks are be. still made by, what is that company? Electronics or something like that? Oh, that's a company that makes, that makes tanks yeah, like, for, like, for amps you know, and stuff? Yeah, for amps and stuff like that. Um, I don't really know. I did have a guy, um, Todd Sharp here in Nashville was working on my amps. Um, it's been a while. I need to probably get back into that, that routine of taking amps there. But, um, but he took an amp of mine once and uh, one of his recommendations, you know, this is for a guitar amp situation, but, uh, he recommended, he was like, Hey, we could probably upgrade the spring. And, and I was like, sure, go for it. And when he sent it back to me, like, I don't know what he did, but man, it sounded so much better. It's pretty amazing yeah. that you can get a spring reverb to sound as good as you can. Yeah, absolutely. They're uh, fun. They they have a totally different way of reacting to the music. Yeah, you know, it's I I like it on you know percussion and yeah. uh, and bass guitar. It's really fun on bass guitar. Oh, nice! I have to try yeah. that. You think that'd be worth it for me to try, even with my little oh yeah one rack space use? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I did a mix, a dub record for my brother's band, uh, which should be coming out soon. They're called Grass out of uh, Gowanus Reggae and S S Ska Society. 
out of Brooklyn, New York. And um, and I used the Avid Black Spring plugin on it, and uh-huh. I couldn't believe how good it sounded. Yeah, that thing's great. It was really awesome, and I and I like I just it was one of those ones where I just kept wanting to like crank even more snare into it and stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's fun to like really jam the input to one of those for like the opening snare hit and stuff like that. And you just uh-huh. go, yeah, cool, man. So you got the console, the uh, the Series Twelve Harrison. The EMT 150 plate, the um, Master Room, Spring Reverb, any other new fun toys for the new room? Uh, I think probably the biggest thing that I've incorporated um, is I, I have, uh, the way I used to mix and that I still do mix is I had all of my outboard gear set um, and I only, you know, I only had 32 outs. Uh, in my old studio, but I uh, upgraded my uh, my converters to the new Aurora N uh, converters, and I bought 48 uh, IO. So now I can use hardware inserts. So I've bought a bunch of other gear, uh, things like uh, you know tape delays, and I have bought some weird old Germanium console, uh, an Altec console that's fun. Um, I bought some DBX 160s uh, and some 165s, you know, and I, I plan on uh, now having a separate rack of gear where uh, I can just put it on hardware inserts and then I can mess with it. And when I get the sound I want, then just commit it and it saves with the Right, vehicle. right. Yeah, I can't remember with the commit feature, can you commit in real time to a track or is it a, is it a not real time? I can't, I, I'm always uh, doing plugins, so I'm never... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, think I if you're doing a hardware insert, it has to be in real time. Uh, Do you remember the old, there was an old trick for committing in Pro Tools where you um, you take the output of the track and send it to something. Actually, no, never mind. You could put an insert on the track and, and send it to the two bus. But then you could, what would you do? You could also take the input of the track and make the input the same input as the return of that in, insert, I think. Oh wow! Something like that, and then um, and then you would mute the track. Uh, this came from Russ Long. He actually published a video on YouTube years ago about it. You take the in, um, then you take that track and you mute it, and you would do this to all your tracks in the session. You mute them all, you put them all in record, and then you put it in punch mode. So in punch mode in Pro Tools, if you're rolling in play, it's automatically recording. Oh, in case I see. you punch in so that you can like peel the track back. Yeah. So then you'd go all the way to the end of the song in play. And at the very tail end, you'd like punch a little bit of record. And that's why you have to have the tracks muted because it's an insane gotcha. feedback loop in that moment. Um, and then that little bit of punch commits the record on those tracks. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I then can you, see how that works. Yeah. And then you, um, and then you just like uh, take them out of record, unmute them, and you just peel the whole track back and you've just like committed. The entire wow. track, and you do it in real time. It's pretty tricky, though. N- definitely, and you have yeah. to like set up <laughs> routing and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, fortunately, things are getting a whole lot easier with. I know. Isn't it ironic stations. that like you're used to hearing stories of like insane engineering techniques for yes. analog? It's kind of ironic to think that you you're now hearing stories like that for just using Pro Tools exactly. and digital stuff as well. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, I uh, I do really enjoy the. Uh, I, I finally upgraded my Pro Tools system to the uh, Pro Tools Ultimate, you know HDX, and you know got a, a bunch of new plugins. Of course, I got more of the UAD stuff and picked up all of the Isotope stuff, and um, you know uh, upgraded my Waves plugins and yeah, you know all the Sound Toys plugins. I upgraded all of those. Yeah, it's uh, it's it takes fun. a minute. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, I had um, Zach Pankos come over and help me out with all of it because oh, cool. he's just kind of a you know super whiz kid with all that stuff. Oh, that's groovy. I don't yeah. know Zach yet. I don't think. Yeah, Zach. Uh, he's a freelance guy here in town, but he um, he was working uh, out at Sound Emporium for quite a while as one of their main uh, assistant engineers. And that's how we became friends. And uh, he uh, actually helped us on the Casey Musgraves record. And uh, that's, yeah, he and I have been kind of working together on things ever since. You know, it's a funny thing about figuring things out and working on stuff. 
there's probably a lot of things any of us could, you know, if we put enough time and effort into it, we'd, we'd figure it out somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then certainly there are people who know the answer to something, and it's great when you've got them around because yeah. you know, they know the answer you don't know yet. But there's also a huge amount of value sometimes in just working with somebody who's just really sharp so you can just kind of figure out the answers together. You know, yeah. it's nice to just have somebody to work on something with. Yeah, especially these days when so much of the work that we do is uh, is done alone. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to just, even for a day, have someone over to help you solve some problems. Yeah, indeed. Um, do you find in your experience, if you're doing, you know, you've got mixing work to do, editing work, whatever it is, uh, do you find that there are benefits to having somebody who is in the studio with you um, versus when somebody isn't in the studio with you? Man, when I'm mixing, I really do prefer to have people around. Uh, and I know that that's not common. Um, but for me, I mean, I, I, I'm confident with uh, my ability to pull a mix together and make it musical. But to me, that's that's just the foundation you know, laying the foundation, it's everything else, the treatments uh, and, you know, um, kind of when you're getting creative, that's how you're really, you know, expressing yourself uh, in the mix. And sometimes uh, it's hard to know what an artist or a producer is comfortable with. Right. You know, if they're not there. And I can tell you this, if, if I was uh, having someone, uh, you know, mix a record for me as an artist or a producer, uh, you wouldn't be able to keep me away. Because right. I would want to make sure that I was there, you know, to experience how that process went down and to be able to say, I love that, you know, chase after that. But this over here, not so much, you know. That, that's the kind of direction um, that is really helpful. So I like having people around. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's plenty that I do in the mixing stage where I don't need anybody to, or you know, sure. there's no room for feedback yet. But yeah. then there's plenty of room where there is plenty of time where there is room for feedback. And it's like it's the same thing with the musicians. Like if you're a musician and you're playing, you know, musicians just do better and perform better if there's somebody that you're communicating to. You know? Yes. Yeah. And music I, really isn't. Um, it isn't meant to be uh, a solitary thing, you know. I mean, obviously, there's a time to sit and practice playing and, you know, or or listen alone. But, man, I, I just think it becomes better when it's shared. Yeah, there's something also about just being uh, committing to whatever it is that you're trying to do, you know, yes. in front of somebody else. Like, you're like, this is it. Yeah, Craig's looking at me. I better, <laughs> I better get my sentence right right now. You know. Yeah. Whereas if it was just me and a computer screen, I would have screwed that up ten times, and I would have, I'd be like, oh, I need a break. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, man. Well, let's see. Uh, let's just keep keep trucking here. Um, tell us a little bit about this this uh, winning Grammy for Record of the Year. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I never. I honestly never thought that that was, you know, anything like that was going to happen. Um, so it was pretty exciting uh, uh, getting to go out there and, and you know, be involved. And, in, you know, I, I mean, I really don't know how to put it into words. I feel extremely lucky that that I ended up, you know, in the room with those people and that music. Yeah. And uh, that I got to participate. And was it um, in the strictly in a mixing capacity, or was it more than that, or was it? Uh, well, no, I only I only mixed uh, two songs on the album. Oh, okay. And right. uh, uh, Sean Everett and Serban Genna ah, were the other two mixers right, on the groovy, record. Groovy, groovy. Uh, but I I engineered the whole record. Oh, okay. So great, great. yeah, I got to be there for the whole process of uh, you know of recording that record, and uh, it was it was a pretty small crew. It was uh, you know Ian Fitchuk, Daniel Tashin. Yeah. Um, Todd Lombardo. Oh, Todd's great. Yeah. Uh, he played most of the uh, acoustic guitar and banjo, you know, mandolin. I need to get Todd um, to come on the show too. Daniel's been on the show and he's yeah. awesome. 
Um, and then I'm still knocking on Ian's door. Ian, yeah. Come on, man. Come on, be on the show. <laughs> Yeah. And then Casey, you know, uh, we were pretty much the people that were in the room the whole time making that record. The only things that um, that I wasn't there for on the recording side were uh, some bits and pieces were captured during the writing sessions that we ended up using. And then uh, the strings. I didn't get to uh, be a part of those sessions, although I was invited to. I was I was busy at the moment, so I couldn't yeah. make it. Were the strings done in sort of a big room strings ensemble setting? Uh, I believe it was Dave Davidson who did those. And he's okay. got a studio up by Jolton. And uh, that's kind of been his business for, gosh, for a long time. Uh, he arranges and and records strings at his place. Right on. Yeah. Um, how would you describe the setup for you guys recording? What sort of a... Was it an intimate, close thing? Was it a yeah big um, big space? Was it isolated? Was it not isolated? So we were uh, w the majority of it was recorded at Cheryl Crow's studio, and uh, it's basically the loft of her barn. There, uh, it, and it's a big open room with the control room in in the open room. So uh, I was there. You know, with a, she has a couple of consoles, a little Neve and a little API, and nice. you know, Pro Tools system. And uh, I was basically there running, you know, running Pro Tools. And uh, right behind me, sitting in a semicircle, was uh, were Todd and then Daniel and Casey um, had gobos up. And then uh, right next to us was uh, a little drum booth. And uh, Ian was in there playing drums. Um, cool. And then how, can you describe a little more? Well, like when we hear um, go head gobos up, it seems like, uh, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, a little bit a little bit of separation. But then you think about it, like, yeah. wait, are the gobos in front of them? Or sort of they, are they between, between each one them. of them? Okay. Yeah, between them. That's uh, kind of a good way to do it. You see that in some old, yeah. you know, old the, pictures. The other thing, section. too, that, we were, uh, that I was doing uh, was I was using a lot of um, – figure eight mics and you know figure eight mics will have a pretty good you know sometimes up to 90 db of uh cancellation on the side yeah so if those mics are put at the exact right angle to pick up the musician but uh have the person next to them in the null you really don't get any of the person even though they're right there the you don't get them because you know, uh, it's just kind of the way they work. They don't hear anything to the side. And, of course, if you get that mic close enough and placed right, then you're going to just get the instrument. Interesting. So then, so this wouldn't be something you'd use if if two people wanted to be face-to-face. -face. It'd be something you'd use if they could be comfortable side at a 90-degree angle to each other. Kind yeah, of almost. yeah. But then if you got three people. We had three people, and that's why they were the kind geometry. of in a semicircle. Yeah. You know, and we did have the short gobos, you know, mainly to uh, keep, you know, keep uh, the vocals out of the acoustic guitar mics and the, you know, acoustics out of the vocal mics. Um, we were using a, on KC, it was a Telefunken 251 in figure eight um, for the whole record. We used singing uh, into it. Well, she's yeah. in the, she's in the trio right there too. Yeah. And she's playing guitar and singing? Uh, she or just she you don't was know, mainly just singing. Uh, she did start off playing guitar on some stuff, and uh, we did use her on guitar for some things. But while we were tracking the basic songs down, most of the time it was she was just singing. And then uh, in the middle, Daniel was pl usually playing bass, uh, sometimes playing electric guitar. Um, and then uh, Todd was usually playing um, acoustic or banjo or mandolin yeah and you know those were those setups were fairly typical um you know on electric guitar i was doing you know a ribbon mic and a 57 and blending them together uh and then on the acoustic i had um a it was a coles 4038 ribbon mic and a km 54 uh neumann so it's condenser. interesting because i think about the coles on the acoustic and a figure eight on a vocal and and just figure eights all over the place, and I started thinking, 
part of what might maybe makes this work is that you were in a room that was big enough too, right? Because if you're in a smaller yeah. home home studio ish kind of space, do you do you start to really yeah. um, hear too much of the room? So those are the figure eight, or, or do you get too much proximity effect? Honestly, you don't want the people to be too far away uh, in a big room, and and it's not the room. I would describe it as medium sized, not big. Uh, and we did have them close together. Uh, so uh, the reason why is that if you get someone too far across the room and it does bleed, there's you can really hear the delay, that like slap delay. And that's yeah. not good, yeah. you know. Uh, so sometimes it's just better to make sure that they're close enough that what is getting into the other mic is not interfering with the, with the performance. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, any other fun stories about about doing that record and working with those guys? Because they're a good good group of guys. Yeah, um, man, the whole time was just was pretty great. We uh, we ended up recording a lot a lot of things that are not on the record, and I'm I'm not talking about songs. I'm talking about instruments. Um, we were just totally free to go like, hey, let's plug this in and see if we can get it to go, and then. Um, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say nine times out of 10, we'd be like, okay, great. Put that away, you know, and we would just put the track away, you know, uh, and, and usually would never revisit it, but we tried. So you recorded a lot of songs uh, probably. Well, we, too. we recorded, I don't remember how many songs we recorded. Um, was it, was but, it uh, more than what made it onto the album? I think so. I think okay. there were a couple that we recorded that didn't make the album. But um but mainly what I'm talking about is we recorded a lot of parts. Right. That, you know, like for instance, you know, Daniel might have been playing bass on the song as it went down. But then later on, I don't know, maybe Ian would pick up the bass and try it right. and see yeah. what came out. And it might have been, you know that we used the new one or we just used a portion of the new one or, you know, that we ended up going back and redoing the bass again, you know. Um, In that, my experience, Ian, somebody who's always sort of a little bit of a go-to for the keyboard, the cool keyboard over to yeah, later too. Yeah, he's really good. Um, Who but, else would know, step in on the drum set? Did anybody else step in? Uh, with, I think it was all Ian yeah. on drums. Drums are one of those funny things. Not everybody uh, feels comfortable to go sit down at the drums. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, and he's just so good at yeah, it. Yeah, he's really good. Um, very cool. Any other takeaways from um, using ribbons, for example, in Coles thirty eight? What if you're going to use the excuse me the Coles forty thirty eight? Um, what are some sort of ouch moments with that mic to watch out for? Well, when I'm using it, uh, like like I was using it on on uh, Golden Hour. Um, generally, I had uh, I had it right up near the acoustic guitar, uh, probably about eight to 12 inches off the instrument uh, and uh, pointed at the 12th fret. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I really, that mic is just for body and warmth. The, uh, the mic that was getting all the detail was the KM54, which is a old Neumann tube mic with a nickel capsule. Yeah, small diaphragm, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And those things uh, have really beautiful uh, top end and mid-range detail. Yeah. Um, not, Almost crunchy or not? I wouldn't say crunchy. They're extremely smooth, but okay. it's, it's very musical. Um, so I was using those right next to one, one another. In most cases, they would be touching. And, and I had yeah. them uh, phase aligned so that the capsule of the of the Neumann was uh, on the same plane as the ribbon, yeah. you know, in the coals, so that uh, there would be no phasing. And then uh, what I would do is usually I would pull up the the KM fifty four, maybe add a little bit of EQ, um, maybe filter out a little bit of the bottom because you know. <laughs> They can get boomy when they're that close. And then I would just bring the coals up underneath and then maybe add a little EQ to that. And then, you know, for the most part, 
uh, that was it. We would usually uh, send those two out of a bus and through uh, 1176. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you have to be careful with those because they can get a little bit pumpy mm-hmm. on... Um, if you start getting, if you start pushing yeah. the needle. But it was just there to, you know, mainly for the tone of the 1176 and to catch any, you know, any peaks that might be coming through. Is there, um, you know, if you were going to share a pretty good go-to starting setting for the 1176 for the rock stars, if they're like, oh, I want to try that. Kind of yeah, any, any I mean, place to start. I would say that uh, I usually put the release, you know, on the fast fastest setting, and then usually the attack somewhere around you know nine o'clock, and then uh, I'll turn up the input until you know I see it, you know, giving it maybe two dB gain reduction. Right. Um, I mean, it's fun to sometimes go in and get a lot more. Um, but on this particular rec- uh, record, that wasn't what we were doing. Yeah, and uh, getting a lot more is very part-specific. Yeah. Right? I mean, like you can, in my experience, you can get away with like a crazy compression, but then, you know, that's you, maybe you have to play single whole yeah. notes or for two bars of yeah. sustain or something like that. And, that. and that's what makes it work perfectly the, well. The only thing I can remember on the whole record uh, doing a hard compressor on was uh, on the, uh, there's one little turnaround on the song Happy and Sad that uh, has like a slide acoustic part. And we had tried and tried and tried, you know, different things to make that turn around work and then one day I just reached over and cranked up the 1176 so that it was really slamming yeah. and I mean you can hear it it's extremely you know it's limited you know I think I did the four buttons in trick yeah, right, right. and uh, and then just cranked it up so and that kind of gave it the character that made that little part of the song work but yeah that's for the, the trick for the most part you know uh, Todd gets uh, Todd really likes to control his own dynamics. So he just, you know, if you compress it too much, he'll say like, I think it's compressing a little much. Right, and you can just feel it. It doesn't yeah. feel right in the headphones kind of thing. Yeah. Honestly, I just like how the 1176 sounds. So yeah, it, it does impart a character that um, that I've always been partial to. Um, do you often have more than one to choose from in a situation like that? Or is it... Um uh, you know, I, I, I've always had one, so I'm like, you know, yeah. that's the only sound I know. But I know they can sound different. Yeah, they can. Um, yeah, I man, getting me started on 1176s. Uh, <laughs> I guess you just try them out. If you I, have I, three, try them and see. I've owned so out. many uh, over the years. I've had you know blue stripes and just about every other revision and you know silver face and 1178s and all that and. I mean, I, first of all, I think it's silly that the silver face ones are so undervalued right, right now. Right. Um, they sound fantastic, as good as any other, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, people seem to be crazy about, like, the different, you know, letter designations yeah, exactly. or all that. Uh, I've had the same pair for, man, 26 years now uh, that I, I bought right when I first started, you know, recording and their F revision. And I just, I think they sound great, you know, but I've also had blue stripes that I know they're, you know, two or three times the money, but I didn't like them as much. Um, they, they are kind of aggressive and can be nice on, you know, certain things like lead vocals, right. you know, but um, I don't know. That wasn't really... Uh, my favorite, although certainly still good and useful. So I, I guess I don't get too hung up about that stuff. Um, I like gear. I know gear. I know how to use gear. But I usually am the guy who just walks into the studio and looks around and goes, what you got? You know? Yeah. yeah. And then we set that gear up and make the record. Um, are we supposed to recap our 1176s? If the caps are bad, I just, I've never uh, done it. I've never yeah. actually heard it being talked about. I didn't know well, if that's something that. I mean, yeah, anytime happens. you have electrolytic caps, they're, you know, the lifespan of one is about 20 years. Yeah. So um, I had had mine for 
25 years and they weren't new when I got them. So uh, I finally had them recapped before I put them in the new studio. And did you notice and, that they were sounding pretty sweet when you did Yeah, they that? sound great. Great. Yeah. All right, I'm going to recap mine. Done yeah. deal. Thanks. <laughs> I did a mic shootout for my vocals in the studio and tried 20 different microphones from the Shure SM7 to a vintage Neumann U67, but was impressed that my favorite of all was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos 2 large diaphragm condenser. Handcrafted in California, Roswell Mics brings you inspired design and attention to detail to help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful microphones, including the Mini K47 for only $349 at roswellproaudio.com. All right, cool. So now you're tracking this stuff. Um, what was what sort of thoughts did you have about this is going to be mixed? Did you feel like we're mixing this as we go? I remember that was a quote that you had from Joe Ciccarelli mm-hmm. in the past from working with him. I don't know if you knew whether or not you were going to be mixing it later, but what what did you think about that? About like you know the mix coming next, kind of <sighs> man. You know. And- it's it's funny with uh, projects that I'm tracking that, you know, first of all, um, I like tracking projects and I would like to be tracking more projects. Uh, it's a, been a, a little bit of a funny thing here in Nashville because before I moved to Nashville, I was, I was tracking all the time. And I was definitely known as like, if you need something tracked and tracked well, this is who you call. And I worked and continue to work all over the place. But in Nashville, when I first showed up, I, you know, the first thing people knew was that I mixed that Aaron McCarley record. So I went for years without anyone calling me to track and all I did was mix. And, uh, and that was a kind of a bummer, you know, uh, the people who call me in Nashville to do tracking, um, you know, they know that I can and that I'm good at it, but, you know, it's sort of funny what what people think in this town. You yeah, know? I mean, when I first learned about you, I was, you were introduced to me through uh, Roger Allen Nichols, you know, as somebody who was doing badass mixes. Yeah. <laughs> I, in fact, I think that's what it says on the podcast. Uh, the last one, it says yeah. badass mixer, <laughs> yeah. which I appreciate. I love mixing. But on, oh, my, you're welcome. I've become my, maybe a little more conservative with my title. <laughs> my, uh, my feeling about, you know, about tracking is that it, it is mixing. Yeah. You know, um, you, you're mixing all the time. So, you know, I'm always trying to give people, you know, the, if, if it goes to another mixer, first of all, I never assume that I'm going to be mixing the record. Uh, and that, you know, I, I don't feel entitled to that. Um, I'm always happy to be there for the part that I've been invited to come along for. And, and uh, there are times when I really want to mix a record and sometimes I get to, and sometimes I don't, sometimes I just mix part of it. You know, I'm happy for whatever I get to do. You know, if you're thinking about somebody else mixing the record, or if you even know that somebody else is going to mix it, are there any things that you might um, do to the tracks or the track organization or the naming or the comments that you want to talk about and, and recommend to the rock stars? Yes. Um, couple things. Uh, you need to name tracks with precision. So, you know, if something, you know, I, I like to, I like to think about what the track is. So if it, there's a Telecaster playing, you know, uh, the rhythm part in verse two, I might call it uh, verse two telly or, you know, guitar telly verse two. You now, know? do you always know that right before you, right when you make the new tracks? No, of- and this is the thing you never, you're never really, you know, get to know. But usually if I don't know what we're doing, I'll be like, what What are we doing? What do we, what do we call this? Um, yeah, I, I try to, you know, I try to be clear if it's, you know, a rhythm guitar with a Les Paul, I'll, you know, call it rhythm guitar Les Paul. If it's an upright piano, I'll call it upright piano. But if it's a, you know, tack piano that's in the bridge only, I'll call it tack piano bridge. And the reason why that's important is, first of all, it's so frustrating to get a session 
where all the tracks are just called audio. Um, or Oh, yeah. Or if they just didn't go through and name things so that they make any sense, you know, um, you have to go through and figure out what they're talking about. And then when they go to recall and they say, you know, yeah, what was that one track that's doing this one thing in the pre-chorus? And I'll be like, I don't know. I mean, they don't know what to call it. I don't know what to call it. But if that one track is called, you know, uh, Juno Pad, they can say, oh, the Juno Pad. And I'll go, yes, I know exactly what a Juno Pad is. And I can find it in the pre-chorus. Uh, it just, it, it allows us to communicate better. Yeah. And you that's know, such a huge part of making records together is, yeah. is having, I mean, to me, that's what the Nashville numbers chart is all about. It's, it's yeah. nothing more than a roadmap communication tool for people to talk to yeah. each other about what they're doing. Yeah. The, the other thing I would say um, that if you're going to track a record and this is, you know, what I was talking about with like, when you're tracking, you are mixing. If you're going to put two mics on a guitar, send them out through a bus and put them to one track, you know? And if you aren't confident enough to do that, then you probably have no business tracking a record. Um, it's well, simple. You do need things. a mixer to do that too, right? Well, yeah. You but, need something with a bus on it. Yeah, you, you do. do the, but, you know, like I, I work in a studio fairly regularly that doesn't have a mixer. So I go into two oxes in Pro Tools and send that to a track. And I, I blend them together that way. Nice. So you can still do it with Pro Tools. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, just eliminating all the extra junk. You know, if there's, uh, <laughs> I thought it was funny. I, I listened to, uh, oh man, uh, Billy Decker. Oh yeah, Billy. And, and, uh, and I loved what he said when the first thing he does when he's setting up a mix uh, with the guitars, he goes through and finds all the ones that say Royer 121 and throws them away. <laughs> throws them I away. can't <laughs> tell you how many times I have done that. <laughs> I laughed because Sorry, I'm like, Royer. I do that. I do that too. We still like you, Royer. We still love you. But well, you know, the thing is, is like, you don't need it. Now, I still, when I'm setting up guitars, I'll oftentimes put a, a Royer 121 and a 57 on an amp and blend them. Yeah. But I, you know, I don't put the microphone name in. I don't need to, you know, I, cause I just call it whatever it is. If this is, you know, lead guitar strat, you know, I call it lead guitar strat and I blend the two mics with the blend that I like. And then that's what the mixer gets. Yeah. You know, don't make the mixer do all of your work, you know, uh, cause at the time you're recording it, you're the mixer. So, you know, you got to think that way. Well, I like your suggestion of taking advantage of AUGS inputs in Pro Tools. So you would bring in, you know, if the two mics were coming into Pro Tools on 7 and 8, for example, you'd make two mono AUGS tracks that have yes. input 7 and 8. Yep. And, and then those go to bus, you know, yep. 50 bazillion. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the track right below it is just called guitar. Yep. Lidge's guitar, and then the input is bus 50 bazillion into that. Now, are we going to run into some weird latency stuff we need to be aware of or watch out for, or is that uh, not so uh, much of an issue? Maybe. maybe. Um, I, the times I've done it, I haven't really had that problem. Um, but uh, I imagine, especially if you're getting up into higher sample rates, that could right. become an issue. right. Yeah, or if you're trying to squeeze plugins on anything yeah. in there, too. I would say that if I was in a situation where I had to take two tracks and record one, you know, separate ribbon and dynamic, I would record those two. And then before the day was done, I would blend those two and put them to another track. Yeah, and another trick that I've tried um, is to record the two two things onto a one stereo track. So uh -huh. it's a stereo file. And then you can use like a, some plug-in on there, like the trim plug-in to kind of sure. pan them together. But even that gets a little clunky. But maybe yeah. if you did that, then like you said, at the end of the day, you could just commit that track. Now you got a mono. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't know. I might be butchering <laughs> this, this idea as I'm coming up with it. But I, I love, you know, the reminder to just constantly commit. Like don't, don't create more stuff. Plus, what if you get a balance of a sound that's really good? Now you're going to have this opportunity to undo it later by accident, you know, yeah, by well, having two tracks. If it's worth doing in the tracking session, it's worth committing to. And, you know, that way your mixer doesn't do what 
I've done so many times and throw out the other mic. Because honestly, if if you weren't sure enough to commit it, then I don't have time to deal with it. You know, I can't be sure for you. Yeah. Um, what about some of the things in the drum world where people need to be reminded to do that same thing? Do we want to be blending more things in our drum world? Uh, I don't tend to, you know. Uh, when I'm working on drums, you know, uh, I, I will, I'll commit to sounds like, like especially with room sounds, I'll commit to the compression and EQ on those. Um, but I tend to leave like the basic tracks alone you know the kick snare uh toms uh overheads they might get you know a touch of compression and i will do some eq on them but um for the most part i like to leave those alone so they're clean so that just in case someone comes in and goes you know oh you know what do i do i can't use these these room mics because they're just too blown out well, you still have all the basics and they're all still good. So you can always go back to those and then create your sound from those. Yeah, good advice. Um, so that basically, you know, if we've got a, a kick in and a kick out or something like that or two mics on the kick or we've got a top and bottom of a snare, that's yeah. one place where maybe we're not we're not making a mistake to keep them on se- separate tracks. Yeah, I usually keep them on separate tracks um, just because uh, especially with things like kick drum and snare bottom, you're never quite sure how much you're going to want once you get to the mix. Yeah. But but I'll also, I got to say, uh, plenty of times I've just done a single kick and a single snare and blended them together too. Um, I mean, that's one of the things where if you, uh, if you want to, you know, go for it. If yeah. you don't want to, it's not unusual we're usually in the mix scenario, we're used to having separate control of those things. Yeah. I feel like, you know, it's funny, first of all, that, you know, the sound and tone and crack and brightness and EQ of the snare, for example, is one of those things that always seems can feel elusive right up till yeah. the final balance of the mix. Because exactly. it's almost like you don't know it, it, it. That's one of those places where it can be a competition in the, in the mix. It seems like mm-hmm. you don't really know. What it's up against and competing with. Yeah. yeah. Because there can be such a difference between what you're hearing and tracking versus what's finally there. Yeah. Maybe that's partly it. Maybe in those sessions where what's going down in tracking is quite representative of where we're headed, it's easier to to commit to those sounds or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know this that, you know, I'm not, if someone gives me a single snare mic, I'm not going to cry about it. You know, I'm not right. worried. You're too not a much. crier. Eh, sometimes, <laughs> but but that's not one of the things that I'm going to be upset about. I will be upset if you give me uh, a single snare mic that you have blended poorly and then compressed, yeah. and then there's so much high hat in it we and, can't use it, and EQ'd to you know uh, extreme. That's that's going to be upsetting uh, because then I won't be able to do. I, I won't be able to make it sound as good as it can. Yeah, you know. Um, and I find that a lot of people who are doing tracking these days are not familiar enough with mixing and how sounds blend together to, to, uh, to be able to make those calls. Yeah. So, and I, I guess kind of what I'm saying is like, you need to figure that out. (laughs) You know, you need to figure out how to mix and, uh, and that will inform you how to be a better tracking engineer. Yeah. It's a funny, uh, chicken and the egg scenario. It's like, yeah. You, to mix well, you got to learn how to track well, and to track well, you got to learn how to mix well. See, I think, I think it, it, the easier way to say it is that the whole job is mixing. Yeah, and if you mix well, you will be a good tracking engineer. Mix well. We need two shirts or coffee yeah. mugs that just say mix well. <laughs> mix well. <laughs> cool. Well, let's take a break for just a moment. We'll come okay. back in for the jam session. Rockstar is a reminder that we've got links to stuff we're talking about um, over to Craig Alvin's website. Um, so you can go check out his work and then also YouTube playlist in the show notes. So just click through there and um, we'll see you guys in just a moment for the jam session where we're going to dig straight into mixing.
The Spectra 1964 model was created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that have protected the free world for over half a century. The extremely stable high circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you clearer, punchier, dynamic recordings. During the height of record making, the 101 preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City record plant, bringing you the sounds of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same sound in your studio with the STX100 Mic Pre and STX500 EQ. Add the Cinemag Transformer BBDI and the C610 Comp Limiter, and you can have a truly awesome sound. Go to Spectra1964.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Whisperoom ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisper Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Craig Alvin joining us at the studio, and we're going to jump into talking about mixing, 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 because that's what we love to talk about. Craig, you ready to jam? Absolutely. All right. You ready for me to start asking you the question I promised I was going to be asking in the first place? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, talk us through a little bit of your mixing setup. I know that you, I know you just made a transition, so you might mm -hmm. still be in transition. Yeah. But maybe talk a little bit about your vision for like what you're, I mean, feel free to tell us what you're doing now or tell us like what you're thinking about what would be kind of fun to explore next. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I, when I'm mixing, uh, whether I'm doing it on the console or in the box, I, I actually set up pretty much the same way. Um, I, I like to, you know, think of things uh, always as being on a console and flowing like they do with a console and outboard gear because that's where I come from. Yeah, it's easier on my brain too. Yeah, and I just know what the stuff is. And the great news is, is that, you know, um, what what I'm going to explain, you can do, even if you don't have all the plugins in the world or the fanciest DAW, um, you, you can do these things and it will make your mixing better. So... Love it. Um, getting started, uh, I think that we have to... We have to think almost, you know, scientifically about what what are you doing as a mixer? And are we starting with our ears? No. We're we starting with our speakers. In fact, you can do most of these things without listening. Nice. Yeah. Like the my first thing I always do when I get a session is I, you know, I go through and uh, clean up the, you know, the gunk. There's usually some stuff at the beginning and the end that needs to go. Any guitar noise, any, you know, something. If I pull up a sound and it just sounds wrong, you know, I'll go find a way to make it right or at least right. make it a little right. better. Just because I don't want it to frustrate the process, you know. But so that, you know, beginning and end gets cleaned up. You know, everything kind of gets put where it needs to be in the order that I like it to go in. And um, I get my master bus set up and the basic things I'm going to want to use, just put it all in place. And then, um, and then I get started. Now, does this include, um, do you do anything with the rough mix? I, I usually, the way I work uh, is I don't, I don't use a master aux like you have in Pro Tools when I'm, uh, when I'm mixing because, um, I prefer to use a regular auxiliary. Uh, and then I go out of that into an audio channel. So that I can, this gives me two advantages. Um, I keep that audio channel in input, but if I want to compare it, A, B it to anything else, any song I pull in or whatever, I can just put that on that, on that track and A, B. So I can go back and forth uh, just by hitting input. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's like you can drag a reference mix onto the yep. print track, your, your mix printing track or whatever, um, which I, I don't know if you actually print to that track, but then mm -hmm. depending on which, whether you're an input or not an input, it's either playing the reference mix in that moment or it's, or it's playing, playing the, the input that's coming through the mix you're working yeah. on. The other thing that uh, works nicely is that if you, we've all been in the situation where we're chasing our tails with a mix where, you know, you don't know if it's getting better. So you keep turning things up and turning things up and EQing and, and you just don't know if it's getting better. Well, pretty regularly, I just print a version of where, I, where I'm at. So, you know, if I've been working on the mix for an hour, I'll be like, oh, it's time to print. I know I'm not done, but I just print it like where it's at. That takes a snapshot of where it's at. So then I have something to go and compare it to. Because if I find myself 30 minutes later feeling that frustration of like, have I made any progress? I can go back to that previous version. And I always do, like, when I do that, I do a save as, and I number it. So, you know, it's like the name of the song, then it says CA mix, and then 0 .01. Like at the moment of print. Yep. Yeah, because otherwise, if you want, if you were like, I liked that version of it. You can't get back. What could you go back to if you didn't yeah. save it on its own safe little yeah. thing? So I do that. And then move on, and I name the session the same thing I named that track. You know, name of the song, CA Mix, 0 .01. And then the next one is, you know, that, but 0 .02. Mm -hmm. So I always have a record of where I'm at, and I have that saved in a session. Because if I go like, wow, everything was just sounding a lot fuller and nicer at version 5, and I'm on version 7... I can close version seven and go back to version five and go like, okay, dummy, don't make that mistake again. Yeah, you yeah. know. And I like that you started with point oh one. Yes, and that's rock stars because Craig has got ninety nine problems, but the mix ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, all right, cool. So that's groovy. So it's that process of saving stuff. There is one thing that I do to screw that up sometimes is I go back to that one that, that I, you know, I consider that that save as version that printed that version mm-hmm. of the mix to be sacred. Like, don't dare screw that up because that's the one you have to have later. Mm-hmm. And I will still open it and hit and make a change and hit save back. And I'm like, oh, crap, I just screwed up that yeah. version of it. Yeah. So every once in a while, if I think about it, I might go into Finder and do the get info on that track and lock yeah. it. Yeah. There's a little lock button. You can yes. lock that file and that'll just keep you from saving over it. Yeah, that's great. But it's a little bit extra effort, you know. Well, setting up this way, uh, the great thing about it is that you do get that instant feedback of like, how does this sound compared to somebody else's mix? And how is my mix progressing in relation to where it was previously? It really gives me a solid way of knowing I'm making progress. So uh, that's the reason why I do it that way. It takes a little longer, you know, when you're bouncing down, you have to actually track through the whole song. Right. But, um, but that's fine. Right, in real time. But usually you're doing that anyway because you're listening. Yeah, that's listening, more listening is better. It is, except for the fact <laughs> that when I listen, that's when I go, oh, hold on, everybody, and I hit escape, and I, you know, I, if I'm bouncing, yeah. and I bail out on that, that when I go make a tweak. Um, although, the way you're doing it, if you wanted to make an adjustment to just one little teeny part of the song, you could yeah. actually punch it in yep. to that track. Yep, and I do that often. And uh, the great thing is, uh, is that you can just punch that in. And I mean, if, as long as you slide the thing over a little bit, you don't even have to put crossfades in. It just, you know, it just works. It's all sample accurate. Oh, slide the punch in or punch out until yeah, you hit a point. zero crossing yeah. point. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that works really well. Um, you didn't mention this, but I'm going to venture a guess that your reference track um, might be a mastered version that's louder mm-hmm. than the mix you're working on right now. Yep. Um, do you use clip gain or something as a quick and easy way to make uh, that reference track match the volume of your mix? Yeah, clip gain is a good way to do it. Um, but honestly, usually not. Usually I have that that track that I'm, you know, printing to turned down about a half a dB. So we're not clipping the output of the converter. And um and then I have on my master bus, uh, it's either uh, an SSL compressor or um, a Neve 33609. Always doing the same thing where it's always getting to about minus four. I have that turned up about 2 dB, feeding into a limiter. These days I've been using the, um, the fab filter uh, limiter, which I, I like a lot. Uh, And that thing is always turned down to about minus nine and should be limiting at the loudest point, minus 6.5. And if you're mixing into that and you do those things, your mix will be as loud as a commercial master. Nice. And then when I go to print, I just disable the, the limiter and print the compressed version. Okay, groovy. So it's like you're you're creating, you know, what some people call the heater yes. version. But and you, you I just spend simply time, disable it when it's time to Yeah, but I do spend time mix. mixing with it off and with it on. Yeah. Um because I want to know what it sounds like without the limiter, but I think it's crazy to know that you're you know your project's gonna get limited. So make sure you know what it sounds like limited. Yeah. It's it's the same concept that seems easy to grasp when you say you're always mixing. We are always making a finished version of this thing. Yes. It why, always should yeah. sound finished. Why would we work on something, you know, over yeah. here when really what we're trying to create is over here all this whole time? Well, you know? I'll tell you, um, the, uh, the funny thing is I always send the loud version uh, to the mastering engineer. And I can't tell you how many times the mastering engineer goes like, yeah, your loud version just sounded better better than anything I could do. You know, I tried, you know, a dozen different things and none of them sounded as good. So I just used that. Yeah, and, there you go. You know, they a lot of times, uh, it's because I was listening with that in, I was able to make better choices and yeah. really optimize the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense too that with, with limiting and stuff that there are um, things, there are balances that might even be slightly different mm-hmm. to work. Yeah, and that's, again, it's like, 
you know, most people mix with more than one set of monitors. Uh, why wouldn't you mix listening to both the compressed and, you know, or the limited and unlimited version? You know, um, I, I like that. I like doing that. Some people have told me they think it's wrong, but here's the thing is it always works. Yeah, if it works, me. how can it be wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think that it's, you know, that's a thing that's a takeaway too, is that for each of us, what's right and wrong is always a little bit different. Yeah. That's what makes us all interesting yeah. and well, unique you have as to, musicians you have to and engineers. Develop and a method. Yeah. Uh, now, going back to what I was saying about, we ought to think about this scientifically a little bit. The, when you're mixing, um, if you want to just take, kind of set aside the creative process and think about what you're doing, you're trying to create... Uh, a balance of the music that you have in front of you that plays back as efficiently and as musically as possible on as many different playback systems as possible. And how, you know, how do you do that? Um, really in, in my way of thinking uh, that that means you have to really consider the low end first and gain stage things correctly so that you can get to a good musical mix that plays back efficiently on as many playback systems as possible. Yeah. So uh, the problem you have is uh, low frequency energy uh, takes a lot more energy to, uh, to reproduce for yep. amplifiers and for speakers. Um, it's a lot harder to do. Also kind of eats up the limiter and everything, doesn't yes. it? Yes. It messes with your limiter. So what I usually do is I start off, I do a, uh, start off with the kick drum, uh, not because that's the most musical thing I want to listen to. Uh, it's a terribly unmusical way to start off a mix. But let me explain why. I uh, start with the kick drum because it is generating a hard transient with a lot of low frequency energy. And uh, I want to make sure that I can make that as efficient as I can, which requires, it does require some filtering, some high pass filtering, yep. usually, and then some EQing and some, you know, uh, processing, usually dynamics processing, um, gating, compression, sometimes limiting. You have to have that, you know, taken care of so that your kick drum not only sounds good, sounds musical, uh, uh, but that it's as efficient as it can be. So that when you are listening to it play back, you're not straining the amp and the speaker and you know hitting uh, your compressors and limiters too hard. Now I do the same thing with the snare drum and then the toms. Um, eliminating any extra, you know, if, if you're, sometimes I like the tom ring, in a song, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially a rock and roll thing. I like that. Mm -hmm. But if, if that's not the kind of song it is, I like to minimize it. Uh, sometimes you get rid of all of it. Sometimes you only get rid of some of it. But you want to minimize it because those things are sitting there ringing at a very low frequency, which is just gunk right. that your amplifier and your speakers are having to contend with. Yep. So go through, get all that. I will do all my parallel bus stuff on drums. Uh, set get that all set up so they just sound good. I go to the loudest part of the song, which you know usually is somewhere nearish to the end. Uh, find that, and then I I set it up so that those drums are hitting that compressor on the mix bus at about minus three. And uh, the reason I do that is because then, you know, minus two, minus three, right in there. That's kind of the butter zone for that. Because and that's, that's the VU level that we're seeing? Well, that's the, uh, no, that's the gain reduction level. Oh, gain reduction of the limiter. Uh, of the or compressor. The compressor, compressor. Yes. Okay, cool. The limiter, uh, when this all is done, should be hitting right at minus 6.5. Right, got you, okay. So, um, and, and, you know, you might find that you, like doing less limiting or more limiting or more compression or less. This is what I like. And I do this every time because this is how I found to make it, you know, efficient. I, we're building it. We're setting a foundation. And uh, so I get my drums there. And once they're there, 
they never get turned up. So you said minus 6.5. Is that the gain reduction at the That's limiter? That's the gain reduction on the okay, limiter. Cool. Yeah. So that, so that to, that means you're seeing that gain reduction thing come down six six 6.5 dB possibly? At, at the loudest point. At the loudest the point. The loudest peak should be hitting at about minus 6.5. Right, Sometimes 6.4, 6.6. Cool. 6. But right in there again is where I've found is sort of the butter zone for this. You know, okay, you that's super it. cool because that that reminds us that that um, to those of us who are a little nervous about what should we do here, we might mm-hmm. feel like that was a bold move. Yeah. And it's good to be reminded that bold moves are good things to make when you're making them right. Well, you're, it, what you want is you want to set up to be consistent. Now, the one time I will say this won't work is if you're doing like some sensitive ballad, you know, that's got a lot of like, not a lot of transient information, a lot of cello, strings, acoustic guitar, vocal, kind of mushy, soft. This is, You have to throw this right out the window because right, that, right. that doesn't work. This, this is, is a usually place for, for like any kind of high uh, high energy popular music. Yeah, Talking yeah. country, Americana, uh, rock and roll, heavy metal, uh, you know, pop music, uh, whatever. This is how I set up. Okay, so, groovy. Very um, cool, man. So then what I do is I kind of rough in the drums. Now, all this is going to change a little bit. We know that. But here's the thing is that we're never going to turn those drums up. We've nice. got a parallel, you know, things in place, basic EQs figured out, uh, basic reverbs figured out, just kind of, you know, maybe I want a little bit more reverb in the chorus. I throw that in, you know, I, but I do this very quickly. Then I go to the bass guitar and anything else that has... A, a lot of low end, and I I knock those things into place. Um, my method for bass is really weird, uh, but this is what I do. I put a SSL compressor on the bass guitar, and I high pass filter it at one twenty because and that sounds crazy, but go with me. That makes it so that when I'm dialing in the sound of the bass guitar. I'm not dealing with the low end. Right. I'm, I'm dealing with the part that will be heard on small playback systems, like your telephone or your earbuds or your NS10s. I, I'm worried about that. Yes, because when we listen to your mix on our speakerphone or on our iPhone, we still want to hear the freaking bass somehow. Yeah, and the problem is, is that um, bass doesn't like to be heard on small speakers. So I dial that in, get a basic sound. You know, usually I'm, I'm a big fan of the fast, then slow compression techniques. Uh, this is usually I'll put like an 1176 on the bass after that and uh, have the attack and release all the way up. And I'll put it on a peak limiter, of like minus, you know, or a, a 20 to one. And then I'll go find the loudest part of the song and make sure that it's only deflecting, you know, a dB or two. Uh, and the reason I do this is because it, you know, bass likes to trigger compressors, and I want my compressor to behave. Right. So I take the stuff out that the compressor doesn't like, and then I put a nice kind of gluey, beautiful compressor on after that, which is usually some kind of tube thing, like That's LA-2A. That's where we pulling out the tone and, and bringing the harmonics back in, maybe. Yeah, LA-2A, uh, Fairchild. You know, something like that. Stay level. Put it on there uh, and get that doing at the loudest part of the song, about minus three compression, you know, at kind of a slow attack and maybe semi-fast release. And did you say that the first thing was an SSL compressor? Uh, it was an SSL channel. SSL channel and using yeah. the low the And I'll usually, cut, low I, I, I will put that high-pass filter at, at 120. And I might do a little bit of EQ. Um, just, you know, maybe bring out some mid-range character on it. Okay, you know? I'm going to interject a comment here. Um, Rockstars, I'm going to encourage you to <laughs> drop comments in. If you're listening to this on YouTube, if you're listening to this at the uh, blog post, if you're just in our, you know, on our in our Facebook group, if you're not, go to rsrockstars.com slash FB and join our Facebook group. But let us know right now how badly you want to uh, be in the room with Craig doing <laughs> a mixed clinic because that's one of the things I'd very much like to put together for you. Nice. All right. Okay. This is so very cool. Keep going. Next step, you set up a parallel aux. And on that parallel aux, you put a Pultec, 
with set to medium bandwidth, 100 hertz, cranked all the way up, as loud as it'll go, and then take your high frequency, put it at 5K, all the way down on attenuate. So this is just your low end. Yeah. Just low end. And you run that parallel, but with, I, I like to use uh, a, like a VCA type compressor, which is like a DBX160. Uh, I actually like the, um, the Waves uh, Renaissance uh, compressor. And this is limited. I t- usually I go 10 to 1. And I will then turn uh, this, you know, your settings are going to vary. But I, I like to have my, be listening to my, um, to my drums and bass together, turn the bass up to where it sounds good with the drums, but not have this in. And then I set that compressor to hitting, at the loudest point, hitting minus 10. Hitting minus 10, we're talking, now we're talking gain VU. reduction. On, gain on reduction. The gain, yeah. Oh, on the compressor. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's hitting right. minus 10 on, yeah. on the gain reduction. And that's kind of like, if when I envision that, I'm thinking we're creating this low end where we get kind of a, um, it's there a lot. There's, it's, yeah, it's there it's, and it's there steadily. Yeah. Now us. this is your low end channel. You have your, you have your base channel, but this is your low end and your low end is being limited separately from your mid-range and high end. By the VCA style yeah, compressor. Yeah, compressor. And you can, you know, use uh, SSL as a VCA style. Uh, you know, DBX160 VU is a VCA style. My Tegler Audio Manufactoire is a yeah. VCA style. Uh, the reason I like VCAs is because they're quick and kind of snappy. And that's, you know, I just think it sounds cool. So yeah. then I just, I bring this up underneath the bass uh, until like the low end just fills out and sounds good, you know, good and even. Uh, then I I will oftentimes pull up another auxiliary that is um, purely for distortion. Right. And I send to that, you know, something that creates a lot of distortion like a sans amp, um, or you know, a decapitator, something like that, and uh, and then I go to the loudest part of the song again, and I mess with the mid range character. I bring this up underneath, but I mess with the mid range character and listen to it on small speakers um, until I get that perceived volume and clarity that I want. Right. Think it's of this like as you can like hear it. In yeah, it's almost like an EQ, but uh, I'm creating harmonics that you can hear. And uh, and then I bring it up underneath. And then what I do is I go to the quiet parts of the song, which are usually, you know, usually if there's like a down chorus or, you know, the verses, and I just pull it out so you don't hear the bass grinding away the whole time. This is just to Talk gain... about mix automation, like muting, yes. muting that channel. Or yeah, I, or I just volume, you know, take volume the volume down. down yeah. Sometimes a little bit of it is nice, depending on on the song and how hard you're hitting that compression. So I, I will, you know, mess with that to where uh, it's usually all the way out in the verse. Uh, also, take it off the last note of the song as the bass is sustaining. Right, for the sustain. Because people will bust you on it because you have to put a lot of distortion yeah. on this thing. Yeah. And you're really only trying to, um, like the way I think of it, I'm trying to get the bass guitar to marry with the rhythm guitars. Right. And usually that's... In the choruses, In too. the chorus and has some gain. Yeah. Because um, it's the first thing that's going to get lost. Yeah. When, you, when you just dropped in, you know, just maybe a stereo pair of guitars or maybe four guitars or maybe more than that plus synths and everything that's all got this mid-range yeah. action... Where do you think the bass goes? It's just like yeah. it's well, and this masked. allows now. Now we're starting to build dynamics into the mix. Now remember, we we aren't going to turn anything up, especially when it comes to these low frequency instruments. We're not going to turn anything up. We set the level, and we check it and make sure it's good. Compare it to other mixes, you know, uh, that other people have done that we know are good, and we get that level set, you know. So then now the bass is dynamically moving through the song. Uh, and we made sure it's efficient. This is all about 
perceived volume and efficiency on any playback system. So we've got that that foundation set for the song. Uh, uh, go find it if you have any like synths or whatever that that contribute to the low end. Bring those in, and then the next thing I do is I find the main instrument in the song, whether it's like could be acoustic guitar, could be piano, um, whatever that is, I bring it into the mix. Usually it's not electric guitar. And I, I like to save my, uh, my electric guitars for last, and I'll explain why later. By the way, I've got an acronym for you. It's DTTFLD, which is don't touch the fucking lows, dude. <laughs> Just remember that. I'm going to like slap, slap my own wrist after we said all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I mess with the lows a lot, um, but once they're set, yeah. once they're set, they don't move uh, unless they're going down. Right, less is okay. Yeah, less is okay. But we never go more. And that that takeaway again is that reminder that um, it's sort of funny how we have to take we have to kind of almost I don't want to say kill the dynamics, but we're kind of removing a lot of dynamics from the sound that yes. was tracked. And then we have to re-add rebuild it, it. Yeah. rebuild it because the mix is, you know, especially for in-your-face rock and pop yep. and modern stuff, we we have to have control over those things because those yeah. things are unruly beasts. Yeah. So, in their natural form. Yeah. Uh, another trick that I sometimes do on the bass is that once I have all this done, um, and I usually, this will be usually done right at the end of the mix, but I will sometimes put... Uh, an EQ on the main bass guitar track after the compressor and with a narrow cue and bump it up just a little bit and slide it down through the low frequency spectrum and see if I find a frequency or two that is causing the whole mix to be muddy. And then that might get ducked like a dB, you know, dB and a and half. And this is on which track? This is on, on the, the, bass the guitar first track. bass guitar track? Yep. On not the, on, on the not first all one, three the channels. The audio track. The audio the, track. The main, the main bass one, The first one you told us about, yeah. Um, and uh, the reason I do that is, again, I'm trying to keep it efficient. And most basses have a resonant, uh, a resonance that will just muddy things up. But if you can find it just by sweeping through, um, if you got, um, if you got the fab filter EQ, the great thing about it is you'll, It'll give you like a little plot, a readout, and you'll see it. There'll yeah. be like one, one frequency range in the bass that is like, hey, I'm the trouble right here. And you just go through there and just narrow cue, duck it down a little bit, make it even. Yeah. You know? um, but I usually do that at the end of the mix because I want to be lit. I do that not with the bass soloed, but with listening to the whole mix. Because you can hear, if you're boosting that just a few dB and sweeping through, you'll actually hear the whole mix start to choke. And you'll yeah. go like, there's my problem frequency. And whatever that is, duck it down, bring it back up, find the sweet spot where it belongs. And the mix will then be running more efficiently. Because that's I like what that. we're going for. I like that because now there's a home for my mishearing of that lyric. When I at first I thought it was "I'm all about that bass, no trouble." You're talking. Yeah. You're giving us the version where it's "Here's all about that bass, no trouble." Yeah, you know, I think the ly- the real lyric is "All about the bass, no trouble." Right? No trouble. Yeah. yeah. All right, go on. So anyway, I've got that set. Now I pull the main instrument in, dial that into where I like it. Pull, and then I pull the vocal in, lead vocal, dial that into where I like it. And uh, then I will quickly automate, you know, um, any, like if I'm doing any reverb delays on the lead vocal, um, just kind of rough that stuff yeah, in. Yeah, the throws and things like that. And this is where I go, okay, my foundation is set. Now when I go to the loudest part of the song and I look at the master bus, I know that I've already dealt with making the low end efficient and I've already put in a, a rough mix on, on bass, drums, and main instrument uh, have the lead vocal in. I, when I go to the loudest part of the song, we should be hitting almost right at minus four on the compressor. And maybe the peaks are right at minus six, minus 6.5 on yeah. the peak limiter. So I know then that I'm I'm in the zone. So then this is where I, you know, go back and I find the other instruments that need to be brought in, all the rest of the guitars, all the rest of the keyboards, you know, B3, fiddle, whatever it is. I bring those in, and then as I'm working on those, I, the treatments I come up with have to work in, you know, 
in relationship to that foundation. They have to square with it and they have to, you know, be solidly a part of it because now we have our foundation set and we don't have to question it. We yeah. know we know it's within, uh, probably within a dB or a half dB of being right. You know, you probably won't find out until you go listen in the car, which is always what happens to me. Yeah, uh, I'll go like, oh man, I overshot just the low end of the base a little bit. Or uh, man, I just need to have, you know, a little bit more clarity on that snare drum and the bridge or whatever. I'll, I'll figure those mysteries out later. Because there is a method for finishing that will let you know you're done with your mix. Yeah. Um, I like that you're, you're talking about building it, you know, getting your foundation right. And it's mm-hmm. like the framework almost. And yeah. the, the ridiculous, I have a lot of ridiculous um, analogies and images. But this one was the, the thought that like, you can't get your, your framework and your foundation right and then go put elephants on the roof or yeah. your house is going to collapse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now this is where we can actually uh, start to bring the other things in. Uh, and w- what I will also do at this point is I will take out a piece of pen and paper and I will quickly like just draw a form across it, uh, left to right, about like the rising and falling action of the, of the song, of the arrangement. Like here's where it starts, goes up here for the verse, you know, down a little for the pre-chorus, up for this chorus, then there's a turnaround, and then back down for verse two, starts to build the second half. And I'll just quickly plot that out and then quickly just, you know, mark off where the changes are and what they're called. Like, you know, this is just on intro. paper. Just a yeah, just on paper. sketch in here. Yeah. And uh, then I go and I listen to the rough and I identify the main characters, the main players in each section. And this this is really helpful. I know it sounds kind of weird, but making this chart will now help you get through the song because you have you already know that the second half of verse two is where the banjo comes in and needs to shine. So you go quickly. I'm going to go through the song. I know my loudest part of the song is set. Now every other part of the song. I might need to pull some things down. Like if the banjo is the main deal in the fa- second half of verse two, I might need to pull the acoustic down to let the banjo shine a little bit. Right. So I do that first. I go through and I might, you know, I might turn the drums all down a DB in the verses. You know, I might turn the bass down. Because you know D, you can't you know. turn them up in the choruses. Yeah. So I turn the bass, you know, down a DB and pull that sans amp out. I might even turn the low end down on the bass that, you know, um, and then uh, you quickly go through and do all those little moves that now you're building the dynamics into the mix. It's not all, you know, turned up to 11 all the time. We have a place for that, you know, and that's the climax of the song. The rest of it, just bring things back. It doesn't, doesn't need to be much. Little bits, half a dB sometimes. Yeah. Which uh, speakers are you listening to while you're making these um, sculpting decisions? Are we still... You know, big and turned up loud, or are we, are I, we in I, medium or small? I almost or? never am turned up loud. Uh, I've got one of the dangerous monitor controllers, and uh, I'm either on my Atomics, my NS10s, or I have a Sony boombox. I also have a, a pair of uh, Sennheiser uh, 600s, and I listen on all four of those in the studio. Um, but usually, this is just one click up on my, on my big speaker's. I, I that's how I'm roughing all this in. At, right at first, when I'm setting bass, like kick drum and bass guitar, I will turn it up loud just to see if the speakers are, you know, barking at me a little bit. So when you drew that chart, that yeah. that sort of flow chart, the first one, you were just listening to drums, bass, main instrument, and vocal. No, I was listening point. to the rough mix. Listen to the rough mix. Okay, yeah, to great. see okay. to see what the producer and the engineer and the artist thought was important in that. And then I quickly, for each section, just go like, this is what's important. This needs to right. transition up here. This needs to fall back here. Maybe I might go like, no vocal delay or delay throw okay. on the end. Right, cool. you know, I will just quickly do those things. Um I try not to be precious about anything because there, you know, there does come a time when you have to be a little bit precious. But these things are all just things that you can do really quickly without having to 
worry or frustrate yourself or chase your tail. Yeah, there's also a lot of benefit and power to to initial sparks of ideas. Yeah, you know, but this is where I start to uh, practice more, uh, you know, creativity, starting to figure out like what treatments to do. Maybe, maybe I need a totally different treatment to the main acoustic guitar on the turnaround after chorus one, you know. Maybe it needs to become smaller and more reverby or something like that. I'll write that down really quick. And then I'd go section by section and do all my notes. That's cool. So notes are done. Gain staging is done. Low end is efficient. It's all working together. I always bring in the electric guitars last because they are right in that range where your ear uh, naturally wants to hear them and it's so easy to turn them up too loud and then you completely screw yourself on the mix. Right. So I get all the other stuff in place then I bring in the guitars and figure out where like the they find that maximum power and and balance. You know, go turning them up a little too loud, turning them down a little too soft, finding that place where they sit exactly right where you're still hearing everything, you know, in, in the rest of the rhythm section. You know, everything's speaking. Uh, that's usually I'll treat rhythm guitars as one bus, a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQ, maybe some parallel compression, get a basic sound there, and then I'll go through individually and do little bits of EQ uh, or a little bit of reverb or something like that to give each guitar character. So one of the things that I want to remind us of is way back in the beginning, you told us you, you've you already gone through each track and addressed if there's a real problem. If there's a problem. So if one of these guitars is so freaking muddy that it, you'd never want it that I've way, already corrected you already it. corrected it. Yeah, that was part of the setup. So now I, that I've done all these things, I've got a mix. I print it. Nice. Okay. Then Lunch break? What's that? Lunch break now? No, usually point? once I'm rolling, I need to, I want to finish. Right. So, um, so I print that, and then I have that, you know, do the save as. Uh, and then I, I can go back now and check what I'm doing. And this is where uh, I can get a little more tweaky. I can make especially transitions between sections. You got to pay special attention to. That's where you're going to start to lose words in the lead vocal, or you might need to do interesting things like a delay throw or swell a reverb up or, or push the, you know, symbols to make the, you know, to make the crash louder yeah, on the, the downbeat, downbeat of the chorus, yeah. you know, any of that stuff. I listen through, do that stuff. And then I'm constantly checking, you know, um, you know, A being, making sure like, oh, I really did make that better. Because I can just click that input button on the track I'm printing the mix to and check my old version and go like, yes, I really did make that better. Good. This is progress. I'm not chasing my tail. Nice. So then once I get all of that stuff done, I usually go listen in the car, identify uh, any problems I hear there, and I come back in and I print that version, and then I, I do this thing. I think I described it on the last, last time I was on here, but I make a VCA in Pro Tools that has everything except for kick, snare, toms, and bass. So that VCA can control the relative volume together of that whole group. Mm -hmm. And then I roll. And, that, and the v VCA creating that can happen later in the game. Like yeah, at this it point. can happen later in the game. You just create a group. Even if there's automation on all those yeah, tracks. Even if there's automation, the automation will move with it. So then that VCA, I take that, I, I take that again to the loudest part of the song and I start to listen. I usually turn it up a little bit, not to ear splitting volume, but you know, to get the excitement going. I wanna I wanna move some air, move the speakers, you know, push the amp to see if I'm making an efficient mix. I have to hear that. And then um, I will take that VCA and turn it all the way to zero. Close my eyes turn it up to where it sounds right to me. And then I try to go past that a little bit, see, you know, where that is, but find that spot where it sounds right. And I've found that it usually is about a dB down from where I had it. Right. Okay. Question for you. Yes. Closing your eyes, raising it up. Are we going to pretty much 
want a real fader in our hands to do this, or is this something we can get used to? No, with I the do mouse? it. I do it with uh, with the mouse in Pro Tools. Okay, and this, great. So I, even when I'm working on a console, uh, I, I on my console I have a VCA for this with a fader. But you know, I you can do it in in Pro Tools. Okay, and it's not cool. A problem. Good, good, um, good deal. But yeah, I will do that. And the interesting thing uh, about this final technique is that you're turning the mix down, but you're perceived, you perceive it as louder. It actually sounds like when you're A-Bing that you're going to a louder mix. Mm -hmm. But you're not. You're going to a mix that's been turned down a dB to a dB and a half. Um, it's just bringing back some of the life and dynamics into it. Yeah, And uh, at that point, I might do that thing on the bass where I sweep the low end and try and find if there's a frequency or two that that are making it, you know, less efficient. And then I know I'm done with the mix. That's awesome, man. That's amazing, dude. I feel a little bit bad for everybody who's been on my podcast because I think I may just go back and listen to this one over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but I'm, seriously though, man, it's so awesome for you to break down the steps like that. And it's such clarity. I mean, there's plenty of stuff for us to each learn about mm -hmm. every single step of that process. But that's just a beautiful clarity to the process. And that's that's what I do every time, you know? And it's like if you you get to the end of you've done all these steps, you know you've done what's needed to be done. I've done everything I wanted to do. And then I send it off to the producer and the artist. And usually usually I get comments back, you know, that are fairly minimal. Um, well, they'll want me to put a little more grit on the vocal or you know, turn the snare up in this one fill or something. You know, there's always something you miss. Yeah. But now, what if you're the producer? Well, I mean, then I just, you know, show you, the artist and listen to, you know, listen to them and do what they like yeah. too, you know. But usually I will put myself, if, if I'm producing, I'll put myself through a little bit more, you know, grief. Right. Um, you, well, you, this helps to step away from it too. Yeah. That that is another thing that I like to do. That is um, that I didn't talk about. That is part of my uh, typical way of doing things. Is that I will um, I will at that point put the mix away and usually revisit it the next morning to see if there was anything I missed because usually there's I find some way to make it better. Yeah. When you listen the next morning, do you uh, immediately have pen and pencil and paper in your hand and take those very first round of notes as you go? No, it's usually something like, oh, I was going a little crazy with the compressor, so I turn it down like yeah. one notch. Okay. Um, or, man, I really do think I need a little bit more low end in the bridge, so I'll turn the bass up a little bit there. Um, it's things, things like that. Uh, sometimes I'll notice that I, you know, the... It sounds good, but it's, you know I'm bored by something. Right. So then I have to find a way to not be bored. Um, but my main thing is it, it's getting all the steps done and having a very specific, you know, uh, like way of doing it every time, and knowing that once I've done all those things, everything's going to be roughly in the place it's supposed to be. So that when I go back and visit it with fresh ears, I can quickly put it put everything in place. Right. And no. Uh, and I don't, I don't have that problem of going like, am I done with the mix? Um, it's only when I don't use this process that I chase my tail. That's really wild, man. I love it. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Do you mind if we go back and dig into some of the individual elements of that sure 
Okay, uh, drums. Yes. Talk to us about some good things to explore as far as um, stuff we might be doing to the drums as we're okay. doing that initial you know, mixing. So, for example, there are parallel compression you could be yeah. doing. And I said there are. So, in my, yeah. in my experience, I've found myself doing more than one parallel compression sometimes. And yeah, I, I usually will do um, a parallel, um, parallel drum bus that I have on a send. So a, a little bit of everything except for maybe the hi hat goes to that, um, and then I will do individual and that's a stereo bus. Yeah, a stereo bus. So, with, and it's usually something I'm crushing pretty hard and just sneaking up underneath. It's usually, right. you know, uh, yeah, usually getting a, a you know ten to you know maybe eight to ten dB of of limiting, and then you know, kind of a slower attack, faster release, just to excite it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's usually sitting about minus, you know, 10 underneath the drum mix. So so the the um, parallel treatment might be limit it first to just shave the peaks off and then compress it to kind of... No, usually I'm just, no? I'm just kind of have something on there crushing it. You just know? crushing it, right. Yeah. But then, I want it to sound, I kind of want it to sound bad because I'm trying to get I'm trying to build those harmonics and, right. you know, get a little bit of chaos. Like, you know, like when you're in a room with drums. It's pretty chaotic. It's, yeah, it's overwhelming. And I yeah. want to create a little bit of that underneath. Yeah. And then and then the thought of sneaking that back into the uncompressed drums is that, it, you know, I also think about it as like, we're not going to let any of the exciting uh, down in there stuff escape us. So it's like yeah. you, you, you're almost bringing up the, the noise floorishness of the drums. Yeah. Not noises and shh, but noises and like all the stuff going on. Yeah. Like there's just a, a whole lot of air moving in that room. Yeah. And, you know, this is just kind of like bringing up that underneath. Yeah. Uh, so that you hear a little bit more detail. And it's not the other way around, Rockstars. Yeah. It's not start with the compressed drum and then sneak in the the uncompressed drums. It's yeah. start with the uncompressed drums, which have all the punch and dynamic mm-hmm. headed to the stereo bus where we'll manage them there. <laughs> I'll tell you a technique that I like on kick and snare. Uh, I like to run a parallel uh, EQ aux, um, Neve 1073. And um, I run it just like you would a parallel compressor. I send out an uh, aux send to the aux, put the, you know, uh, the Neve... EQ on there. And then I crank up the input to where it's distorting pretty good. Pop in the EQ. Start with the, you know, with usually with a low frequency. On snare, I like to do it at 220. On kick, I like to do it, you know, down lower in the one, the 100 hertz, 110 hertz area. And I crank it all the way up. Um, and then I will go to usually it's a 3.2k, and then the top frequency is fixed. And I will boost those two until it kind of self corrects uh, EQ wise. So that you're getting a balanced, but you know, crushed sound. Yeah. But it's really the, it's the, it's the meaty low pot stuff plus the crispy top stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the thing that's nice about that is, uh, those Neve EQs, like first of all, they distort really cool, and it, it's a nice sound to blend in underneath. And this is but, a 1073. Yeah, 1073. Can we get away with this with plug-in world? Too? Yeah, I do. I do it with the UAD. Right. So, on. Um, so uh, the nice thing about these EQs is that they're inductor EQs, and if you know what an inductor is, it's basically a tuned circuit. It's a coil, like like a transformer. You know, well, these things saturate. And so there's only a certain amount of energy that you can shove through one of these inductors. So when you think about it, when you push them too hard, what you're creating is a multi-band limiter. Right. And so I run those into distortion and saturate those inductors so that they have a little bit of that limiting and I can control how much low frequency limiting to mid range limiting to high end limiting and sneak that up underneath and it works beautifully nice so it's it's similar to it's the same thing as the parallel compression for the whole drums it's just that this is another He's doing form. that individually one for the kick one for the snare yep. maybe one for the toms as well i uh, never done it on toms toms, um, toms are always sort of a little bit different beast yeah. than the kick and snare usually yeah right? they are 
Okay, cool. So that might, um, I, I'm sort of familiar with the mono drum crush too, where you're just doing the yeah. kick and snare um, sort of thing. This is kind of a version of that, isn't it? Yeah, kind but, of. But they're not compressing against yeah, each other. Yeah, and it's usually like, I like to bring it up underneath just to where you start to hear that excitement, but you know, too much of it is. It becomes yeah. too identifiable. Yeah. Um, now, is there any kind of mono compression that's valuable as well for, for the drum shells? You know, I, I would say that most of the tracks that I mix, there is a mono, some kind of mono overhead or mono room mic. Um, and I like to use those as uh, effects sends. So if I have a reverb or a delay or something, I'll run out to those. Okay, yeah. cool. Very cool. Um, what about harsh symbols you're getting mm -hmm. tracks from other people sometimes they must show up and and you, and the drums must be lacking some kind of excitement or oh, yeah. there's like harshness in the symbols and and yeah. the liking and stuff what are some ways to address that uh i usually go straight for the um the studer 800 plug-in and i'll put it on like seven and a half ips you know, but at plus nine at my and, brother's uh, dub record i mix the entire thing through seven and a half hips plug-in yeah. Yeah, I like 456 because it smells the best. And <laughs> even uh, in plug-in land, Rockstar. Yeah, that's true. Even in plug-in land. And uh, but it's also really squishy and nice. And then I will turn the uh, the record bias all the way up, and that kind of eliminates the top end. And then the record side of the EQ. Then I will just bring that up to where the symbols become tame. And that's all in the UAD plugin. Yep. They give you all the the, yep. the alignment modules. All the alignment stuff that's is there, wild. so you can just. You can mess with the alignment, but that's really nice because what you're doing there, if you understand how tape works, uh, there's a physical limit to how much magnetic energy the iron oxide on right, the tape right. can handle. So much like uh, you know what I was saying about inductors have a physical limit that you know energy that can go through them. There's only so much of this energy that can stick to the tape. So when you over bias, what you're doing is you're sending a really strong, super high frequency bias signal, which is causing the top end of your recording to erase. Yeah. And then, uh, and uh, because you're operating 456 at plus nine on there, you're not supposed to do that. You're really saturating that tape. And then just by turning up the record side on the electronics, it becomes like a high end limiter. Right. You do this on vocals right. as a de-esser, by the way, and it works great. Nice. Yeah. Um, you ever do the same thing with real tape machines? Oh yeah, when I had real tape machines, I would do that. Would you stuff. do it in a mix stage? Would you actually like start uh, disaligning your machine just to make it work for certain mix? I mean, why not reprint something? Could be back? cool. Um, mainly, what what I would do when I had a tape machine, I messed with the over biasing things like acoustic guitar tracks, yeah. um, piano tracks. Um, uh, you know, snare drum tracks, things that I wanted to, you know, I, I kind of wanted to tame the high end yeah. on, but, you know, get a little bit of that squishiness. I like that concept a lot. It's like put away the meters, you know? Yeah. I don't need my my um, multimeter out or anything like yeah. that for, well, actually I don't really use the multimeter, but, uh, but put away the tone generator and the you know, worrying about doing a correct alignment on the tape machine and just yeah. start trusting my ears on what's playing back. Yeah, well, you got to, you know, the thing is you have to do it. Someone has to be playing. Well, if you're in the mix and, mode, maybe you can feed a yeah, track Yeah, in the mix and, mode, you know, you can you can do it and it's great. That's why I do it. But if you're going to record tape that way, you actually have to have someone playing the track and then you have to mess with the over bias yeah. and the and the EQ and be listening back off the playback head. Yeah, and tell them just just so. ignore what you're hearing in the headphones for yeah. a minute. Take your headphones off. I'll yeah, yell out what just you play. When I need you. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff's really fun. I try to always do that when I'm using the tape machine for drums just to make sure that, I mean, because a big part of why we're using the tape machines at tracking is because we want to make sure the drums and bass sound killer. And yeah. So I'll, I'll just tell the drummers, like, just see if you can play in the tempo of the delay you're hearing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Very, very awesome. Um, I like that. So the tape will help smooth out the high end of the cymbals. Mm -hmm. Now, is that we're sort of taking those overheads that were too harsh and we're putting it through that plug-in to manage the sound, and that's 
what we're now using in the mix, or is this something mm-hmm. that's it's not a parallel thing that we're adding no, to the no, original? No, just put it right on you know in series on the track. Right. So it's like if the original track sucks, mute it, get rid of it. Like let's let's replace it with something that sounds better. Yeah. We're not we're not keeping it around if it sucks. That's probably the the fix for anything that sucks in your mix is you have to remove it, rock stars. <laughs> It can help. Remove the suck. I don't know. I've just learned so many tricks for fixing bad sounding tracks over the years. You yeah. Know, I, you've kind bad, of, man. You kind of forget half of them. Because, yeah, until you need it. Yeah, and then suddenly it'll come back. It's like, oh, I haven't done that for 10 years. Oh, but it works great, you know. Um, you want to talk about some other uh, parallel treatments that are worth exploring for vocals or just... Without, without, I mean, obviously we're not going to narrow down the vocal topic to like, here's what mm-hmm. you need to do. But maybe just if you want to just brainstorm some different things that would be fun for everybody yeah. to try. Try it out. See what yeah, you think. I think, uh, I think last time we went over the Studer vocal trick the, that I came up with. And I, I think I mentioned also about running through a multiband compressor, mm-hmm. uh, even a plug-in one and not doing any compression, uh, try it, A, B it. It's amazing. It will, it does something to vocals that just brings out, like they sound finished. Yeah. Um, well, vocals are one of the instruments where you don't necessarily want them to have a lot of dynamic. No, when not mixing, necessarily. Right? Whereas like, you know, multiband on drums can tame some stuff, but a lot of times it'll, you, like you don't really want to necessarily, not always, sometimes maybe, but you don't usually want to smooth out the power in your drums. You want to, yeah. You know, you want to retain that, whereas vocals maybe is a perfect yeah. place for it. Um, man, on vocals, sometimes I I like a, a you know a parallel compressor that's extremely smooth. Like uh, I have a, a Gates Stay Level that has for years been my favorite parallel compressor. I'll, you know, I'll hit that thing at minus thirty and bring it back in under the vocal, and it just makes everything, you know. Really nice. Have uh, you explored the the Devil Lock plugin? Yes, for the, the same, Devil Lock same plugin track? is. I just used that on a record, and uh, and it does a nice thing too. It, you know, I had to be careful. I started to use it on everything. I'm like, ooh, yeah. that sounds better with it on there too. Ooh, yeah, sounds- it's got it. It has a little bit of evil in it, and uh, yeah, but it does do something really nice. And it's not too, especially because you can adjust the darkness of it. You can make it so yeah. it's not bringing out yeah. the S's and. Um, it's all about that mid-range quality, and again, the perceived loudness. So, and what you're talking about, at least as far as bringing it up, is is a, a parallel treatment. So maybe we're keeping yeah. the the real hi-fi voice vocal yeah. track. But how often does the hi-fi, you know, original vocal track not need any compression at all or nothing at all. I mean, is that really just only in those moments where it was tracked perfectly or is it is it almost always going to get something on that original track to kind of I I mean, I I almost always go and, you know, do something. Yeah. You well, know, you just compress. said the multiband compressor, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I usually do a little bit of something. Um sometimes uh I'll get busted for putting a little bit too much compression on a vocal. And I bust myself to, for that yeah. all the time. You know, but the other, the funny thing is half the time when they tell me to, to do less compression, I end up finding out the answer was more. Right. And then I just don't <laughs> tell them that the answer was more, you know. Um, is it, are, do we sometimes put ourselves in a corner because we're feeling like we just need more excitement out of that vocal and we put something on the original vocal track where, and where we should have made a parallel treatment and mm. added it to what was there? Yeah, I, you know, since I work off from templates, when I set up a song, all that stuff's already in. I may not use it, but it's already in the session. So um, I, I don't have to think about it. You know, I've got all the options I like are there. And I, I will quickly like push one fader up, push another fader up, you know, see what they like, maybe a blend of the two or three or, you know, whatnot. Um Usually, but having it all there, if I don't use it, I can just hide it and put it away. Yeah. You know, but it's all there and it's all routed. It's all ready to go. That's pretty awesome. Um, Arriving at that template for yourself, I imagine that's not something you just went from zero to a hundred on. You probably know that, that, you know, my template, yeah, my template has been uh, for, it took me several years to, to build it. 
um, and it's gone through you know several permutations. But essentially, like the basics of what I do haven't changed much. Um, you know, as far as like the the normal things I, that I know always work, those haven't changed much over the last like fifteen years. Um, before that, it was mostly development. Now it's just been slight tweaks, getting those each one of those things to be more, you know, better, a little, a little bit better, a little more efficient, a little, you know, nicer, um, and then occasionally, you know, stumbling across something else really great and going like, well, that's got to go on the template. Yeah, and then how do you save your template? Where what's what's the safekeeping well, technique that helps us remember where to find it later and all that? You know, my my template is uh, I save a session in Pro Tools that mm-hmm. has part of it, but then I also have the analog side of it too. So, you know, that's all saved just in the racks and in the console automation because yeah. uh, you know for. My console has, you know, full recall of every parameter and, you know. Well, most of us are mixing in the box. So, you know, yeah. the well, struggle so sometimes, what do you, your what do, you console do with this? Your console has a full recall of every parameter too then. So, yeah. I mean, basically the nice thing about my console is that it's analog, but it does all the things the mixer and Pro Tools does. But I mean, for example, if you're mixing a song for, um, you know, a particular artist and you're like, that was great. Do you just automatically like do a save session copy without any audio in it over into a folder so that that would no. be like, oh, there was that mix I no. did for so-and-so. And, you know, I got to say, I do have I do have a session with a lot of the template stuff saved. But normally what I'll do is I'll go like, oh, man, I was working on something a month ago and then we did something super cool with the, you know, with the bass guitar. So I'll just do, um, you know, import session data. Just from that particular And then particular blow out mix. the automation and adjust it so that it works, you know. Right. But right. um, I, I, I'll do that stuff all the time. Or, man, I really like this, you know, horn treatment or this background vocal treatment that I did over here. And so I'll pull it in real quickly and then modify it for what I'm doing. Into the song you're working on yeah. today, for example. Yeah, but I mean, that's, I mean that, that's the thing is that I'm mixing, I'm mixing so many songs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. think, I think I have 20 songs I have to mix this week. So if I didn't have you know, ways of doing this efficiently, I would never get it all done. Yeah. Well, and you're always carrying along all these, these templates are just in the mm-hmm. thing you worked on yesterday or last week and yeah. just carrying along with you. Yeah. And they kind of evolve and change and, you know, that's part of what I like. I like, I like, you know, overlaying uh, interesting things from other productions that I've worked on. Uh, onto what I'm working on now because sometimes you get these wonderful surprises because it never comes out the same. Right, you know? right. But, it, but it's, you know, sometimes it's really inspiring and sometimes you're like, ooh, that didn't work at all. Right. <laughs> but it's fun to try, you yeah. know, it keeps it interesting. Um, dude, that's so cool, man. What questions have I not asked you about mixing that we need to, that you need to tell us about? Anything? Man, I think, uh, I think, I think I was able to cover everything I wanted to cover. I'm, That's I'm the still process. Like, you know, I'm still spinning. I'm reeling. From your, <laughs> well, your mix setup. Yeah, maybe we need to go back and you know break it down into sections and number it and put it in steps. Maybe we just need to listen to this carefully with a notepad and yeah. a pencil and go practice some of the things you just told us to. Yeah, it's, that's what I'll be doing. Um, let's see. Let's let's jump to some closing questions here. Um, okay. I'll ask you a couple here on the way out. The business side of doing this, if if the rockstars want to do this for more than just a hobby, do you have any tips that you maybe want to share, you know, that that might be new to you from over the last couple of years since we did our last interview or any advice for making sure that you 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 do this in a smart way? Uh, no. <laughs> no. All right. All right. Good enough. <laughs> I am. I am terrible with the business side. I mean, I I have uh, I have people that help me with that. Right. Uh, you know, honestly, my wife does all the billing for me. So, uh, and I have a manager that helps with uh, when I have projects that are kind of you know more stressful and and require a lot more help on like you know calendar and yeah all that. Um, Maybe that Melissa that- handles that and I. I'm really, you know, I'm one of these people that I'm, I'm really good 
in the studio. But I, you know, all that stuff, I've just always been kind of either just terrible at it or not uninterested, but I know it's important. So I, I have to pay other people to do it. I, th- I feel like that was the same feedback that Sean Everett shared too. It was just like, yeah. stay focused on, on the art. And, and that is yeah. a great takeaway. It's like, separate the art from from mm-hmm. that stuff. And um, if you can separate it by by bringing in other people, then great. And if if uh, for for many of us, probably the separation is just simply find a smart app that works that makes you not have to think about it so hard, you know? Yeah. Um, how about uh, organization stuff? Anything in the organization? You know, we, we all have to manage yes. so many hard drives and digital files. Anything yes. new for you? I have recently come across an app that I've been using. Uh, called Keeper and it manages all my passwords for all the websites. Oh, yeah. I use I'm using one called 1Password that I find really helpful too. Yeah. Those things are great. Yeah. I I'm really I mean that has changed cuz I'm just awful with that <laughs> stuff. I can never think of a good password. I can, you know, I feel like half the time I, you know, I, when I do come up with a password, it doesn't matter if I come up with a really good one because I'm going to forget it. Oh, yeah, me you too. Know? Um, so uh, this has a, like a password, a random password generator. And, you know, when you go to the app, especially if you're just, you know, cruising through things on your phone, I can then actually go through the app to open the website and it'll automatically. Yeah put the password in for Yeah, me. those are very hip. Yeah. And then there's so many things you have that that ask you for a password and you're like, "Really? I need <laughs> I need to have a password to remember for this yeah. freaking site or whatever." So, yeah. Good tip. Um all right, uh so you, I th- you think you answered this question on the podcast last time, but I'll ask it again see if there's any new new thoughts or maybe more recent ones, but um you know, if you if you could go back and tap yourself on the shoulder and say, "Listen, Craig, Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio. What advice would you go back and give yourself? And I don't know if you want to go back in this in this question and I, I know back exactly what I would tell myself. Back. Yeah, go ahead. Keep that pair of blue stripe eleven seventy sixes. All right, there you go. Yes, <laughs> rock stars. You know, we all have. We all just got permission to <laughs> hoard because that's what I do. I just keep. But you know, you've been great about that. You actually. You're not a hoarder for the studio. You you said no. You talked about getting rid of the stuff or narrowing it down to the stuff that you really used a lot and yeah. repeatedly and kept keep just that. Yeah, uh, and you know everything I kept was you know really smart, but there were a few things that I shouldn't have let go. Yeah. And you know that pair of blue stripe eleven seventy sixes, I shouldn't have let those go. I shouldn't have let my LA three A's go. Uh, I should have kept at least one more stay level. Yeah. You know, I like there are just so many things that I've, you know, had. And there's a lot of great things I've had that I was really happy came into my life. But when it was time to sell them, it was time to sell them. And I don't really spend too much time worrying about it. But there yeah. there are a few things where I'm like, oh, man, that was that was silly. Should have held on to it. There are a remarkable number of things where I look at it. I'm like, okay, Lidge, ask yourself, when was the last time you used this? Like, if it's been more than two years, do you need yeah. to keep it? You know, I tend to say, yeah. Well, dude, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us again. Rockstars, one more time, I encourage you to please drop a comment in and, and just uh, blow up my inbox, my email, whatever you want. If you want to uh, hear more from Craig, I think we have an opportunity to do some pretty fantastic teaching. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, let the Rockstars know where they can find you online and learn more about you. Uh, just You can find me at uh, craigalvin.com and, you know, uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram just as Craig Alvin. Right on. Well, thank you, dude. Thank you. Can't wait to come over and see your new studio. Absolutely. All right, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. 
You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, Rockstars. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things that I highly recommend you check out for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers.